one problem with this paper, uh, as will become apparent all too soon, is that I want to do more, much more, um, than I can possibly do well in the time available to me. Um, so consider this some rough notes from a work in progress. Back when I submitted my abstract, I thought I would find something clever to do with the slash in my subtitle. Um, something about care being something that we take and not just give. And that's how, that, and how that's a kind of taking that normal people, quote unquote normal people, um, and not just pirates, value. Something about the shift in the past decade or two, at least in the US, to use the term caregiver for people who were once referred to as caretakers. Um, something about slash fandom as a kind of pirate practice that's often much more clever and fun and interesting than the original uh, cultural text from which it steals. Lots of scare quotes in this talk. Um, and there's still hints of these things um, in the notes that follow, but nothing quite as fully fleshed out as I'd originally thought. Um, but hopefully these under-polished notes can still resonate with the rest of the conference in useful ways. So the paper proper begins with a piece of a 17th century English folk poem. The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, but leaves the greater villain loose who steals the common from off the goose. The law demands that we atone when we take things we do not own, but leaves the lords and ladies fine who take things that are yours and mine. Pirates take things. Arguably, it's the very essence of what they do. Pirates are thieves, bandits, rogues, and outlaws. If you believe the dominant narratives, pirates have spent the, half, the past half century, if not longer, plundering our culture to devastating effect. Music, film, television, radio, books, newspapers, and most scandalous of all, academic journals, have all supposedly been brought to the brink of extinction by pirates, bootleggers, and freeloaders. Corporations also take things. Arguably, it is the very essence of what they do as well. Google and Disney owned vast and control vast swaths of culture that they did not create. The dominant narratives about corporations, however, are far kinder to them than they are to pirates, largely because some of the largest and most powerful of those corporations get to shape those narratives in their favor. Typically, copyright activists and critical scholars intervene in these issues in ways that echo that folk poem. They reframe piracy as a form of giving or sharing, and corporate practices as a form of theft or appropriation. And I'm sympathetic to such efforts and have engaged in them myself, but today I want to take a different tact. Um, the question I want to wrestle with is not who is taking culture that doesn't belong to them. Instead, I want to ask who is best taking care of the culture. If we understand culture to be something inherently collective and communal, and we should, then questions of private, individualized ownership are distractions from the more pressing issues of who best serves as the caretakers for a culture and what that work looks like. I also want to resist a common tendency in copyright activist circles, again, a trope that I'm sympathetic to in many ways, to think of piracy as something that operates outside of and or in opposition to, quote, real culture. There's a sort of swashbuckling romantic appeal to such a narrative, of course, but I want to su suggest something a bit more radical today. Namely, that piracy is culture. Not a subculture, not a counterculture, or an oppositional or marginal or minority culture, just culture. What distinguishes the major practices of piracy from the major practices of official culture is not any substantive difference between those practices, but rather a question of whose versions of those practices have the formal blessings of governments and corporations. It might be helpful here to <coughs> steal an old quip from linguistics uh, about how the only important difference between a language and a dialect is that the language has an army which is to say a language is simply the dialect used by the segment of the population with the most legal and economic power. Otherwise, a dialect doesn't function differently from a language in any fundamental or structural ways. Similarly, we need to remember that labels like piracy aren't so much descriptive as they are prescriptive. Rather than simply reflecting some mythical objective truth about the world, they create and maintain distinctions that would otherwise not exist or matter. In particular, one of the major distinctions in play here says that culture is something special and sacred that is only made and owned by some very limited number of people, or increasingly by corporations, whom, of course, we're supposed to think of as if they were people. While piracy is a parasitical phenomenon practiced by people who lack the capacity to make culture of their own. <clears throat> 
or so the story goes. And here's where I need to bring Raymond Williams into the conversation. Perhaps not quite in ways that he would have approved of, um, but of course this is part of how both piracy and culture work. That is, they involve people finding stuff that other people have done, picking it up, reworking it in ways that suit them, and then putting those reworked things back out into the world. When Williams wrote in 1958 that culture is ordinary, he was not thinking about piracy at all. Instead, he was looking to intervene in the English versions of the mass culture debates of the 1950s, um, and particularly versions of that debate that placed the working classes somewhere outside of culture entirely. And a crucial part of what he was reminding us is that culture is produced, maintained, repaired, and transformed by ordinary people everywhere. This ordinariness, this ubiquity, is the very source of culture's value, its power, and its magic. New cultural texts and practices are created by people taking pieces of existing culture, often from very different places, cutting them up into smaller pieces, and then mixing them together in new ways. They take the old pieces and they put new twists on them, they cut and paste, they remix, they transform. Very little, if any, culture has ever been produced that hasn't depended in significant ways on the stuff that came before it. Oh, this is so natural. Um, <laughs> old cultural texts and practices, what we sometimes refer to as tradition, are maintained by people continuing to use them, share them, distribute them, and circulate them. When people stop telling a particular story, it falls out of culture. When they stop engaging in a particular cultural practice, it dies. Both ends of this game, the new and the old, depend heavily on ordinary people doing ordinary things. By and large, they do not require corporations to do anything. And if anything, corporations tend to do these things very badly. In many ways, the dominant business model of corporations with a visible stake in culture depends on throwing sand in the gears of ordinary cultural practices so that the corporate versions of those practices become the only game in town. Disney, for instance, does not want you to put new twists on the stories that it owns, despite, or perhaps even because of, the fact that this is precisely the kind of transformative creativity that originally made Disney into a media giant. And so, from the perspective of people, or corporations, with major economic and political clout, piracy is the label applied to ordinary cultural practices, both for making new culture and for keeping old culture alive, that don't help those people, corporations, maximize their profits or their power, but that are popular enough to threaten the dominant business models of the moment. As Larry Lessig and others have noted, the history of media technologies is filled with examples of this. The phonograph, the player piano, radio, broadcast television, cable television, and the VCR, to name just a handful, were all once forms of new media um, that were clearly making somebody lots of money, but not the folks who had been making lots of money from culture and entertainment beforehand. And so those folks, the ones who had already been on the scene, um, worked extraordinarily hard to squash those new pirate technologies completely or, if those efforts failed, to take over the new technologies in ways that magically undid their pirate status, because now the right people were able to profit from them. But back to caretaking. A large part of what it means to take care of a culture is to keep it active, alive, in motion, in circulation, in flux, in process. And corporations are very keen on keeping things locked down, stable, in stasis because that makes it a lot easier to control and profit from those things. By and large, ordinary people, pirates, don't care about the profits. They care more about the health and the well-being of the culture. I want to give four examples of this. Um, one of how bad corporations are at, are at cultural caretaking, and then three of how good pirates are at doing so. And the bad corporate example involves film preservation. Silver nit nitrate film stock, which was the dominant technology for movies up until the 1950s, is a fragile, volatile, flammable medium. It's combustible at relatively low temperatures, and it degrades rapidly if it's not stored properly. Roughly half of all the US feature films made before 1950 no longer exist at all. They've just crumbled or burned. Fewer than 20% of all US silent films ever made still exist. Film preservationists will tell you that there are thousands and thousands of old films sitting in canisters in vaults and archives and storage facilities that are slowly rotting away if they haven't already 
and that those preservationists would love to be able to try and save and restore as many of those films as they can, but they can't, not legally. What stops them is a combination of factors, but the key ones are A, film preservation of this sort is an expensive and laborious process. It's not something you just do in a weekend with a handful of dollars that you pull out of, the, out of your couch cushions. And, many of the, and B, many of the films that they would love to save are what are called orphaned works. That is, text for which it is not clear who, if anyone, holds the relevant copyrights. And so preservationists tend to be um, very reluctant, if not terrified, to start trying to save such films from chemical death for fear that they will spend massive amounts of time and money on efforts that will land them in legal trouble for unauthorized use of someone else's intellectual property. The film industry could quite plausibly do something about this. They could publicly agree to waive whatever rights they might have in preserved films that turn out to belong to them when they, they're sort of fully preserved and revealed. Um, or they could lobby Congress uh, and other relative or relevant regulatory bodies for changes to copyright laws that would allow orphan works to be preserved without legal penalty. And yet they don't. They make empty noises about how sad it is that all that cultural history may be lost. And then, to the extent they do anything, they find ways to protect and preserve films that they know they control. But that's it. The studios only take care of those particular bits of culture that they deem to be profitable. Let's turn to a good pirate example. The golden age of hip-hop, with smaller but significant echoes in mashup artists who arose in the post-Napster age. Here we have a bunch of pirates supposedly talent, lots of scare quotes in this sentence, supposedly talentless thieves who made music simply by stealing the good bits from other people's records, slapping them together, and then claiming them as their own. But these pirates were incredibly savvy and talented curators, archivists, and recombiners of a broad range of musical genres. Hip-hop samplers took care of the culture by honoring their major musical influences and helping to make their music matter again to new audiences. James Brown and George Clinton both enjoyed career resurgences in the 80s and the 90s, but they did not do so because their record labels found ways to keep them in the public eye and ear. They did so because DJs, hip-hop DJs, built new records out of their old grooves and helped remind, or in some cases, many cases, inform a new generation of fans about these old folks whose music would otherwise have you know, gone into the bin. Good pirate example number two. There is a kind of digital file sharing that is much older than Napster. It covers a much broader range of cultural texts than Napster era file sharing programs typically did. It includes music and movies and TV shows and video games and software and ebooks and so on and so forth. It is still used today by significant numbers of people around the world, and it somehow managed to survive the media industry's anti file sharing wars without getting shut down without getting co-opted in the ways that Napster and Grokster and BearShare and other sort of lost file sharing platforms were. I'm always hesitant to discuss this example um, using its name, its real name, out loud in public forums for fear that drawing too much attention to it will accidentally help remind the Disneys and the Foxes of the world that there is a place online that millions of people use every day to share pirated media. For our purposes today, I will simply call it the library. That is not its real name, of course, but it's a pseudonym that fits it very well because one of the caretaking practices that the library does exceptionally well is to digitize, distribute, and archive pre-digital forms of media that apparently are no longer profitable for their official corporate owners to turn into CD box sets or Blu-ray discs or even digital files for online sale or streaming. Do you want pre haze code Hollywood movies that were never officially released as DVDs? old blues, jazz, hillbilly 78 records that may never even have been remastered and re-released in the LP era, classic video games that were discontinued a decade ago. All these and more are the kinds of cultural texts that someone out there has in some sort of pre-digital format and has done the work converting them to digital files that are in formats that are in common usage now and then made them available online purely as an act of love and respect, and a desire to share these unmarketable bits of culture with other people. There is no profit involved in this particular, in, in, in the library's work. 
Now, I will admit that on one level it feels silly, perhaps even overly dramatic, for me to be cagey about using the library's real name in this forum after we heard from more than one person yesterday who is putting their own life and liberty at risk for much more noble causes than publicly sharing some dusty 1930s newsreels or scanned versions of 1950s comic books. Part of my caginess is connected to the fact that it is not my place to add to whatever risks that the major contributors to the library are already taking with what they do. Most of my caution here, however, is rooted in my final example, which reveals that all forms of piracy, even the seemingly safe and trivial ones, can come with very serious risks. And so good and yet very sad pirate example number three. Aaron Schwartz who was, among many other things, a hacktivist. He believed, quite reasonably, that academic knowledge produced using public funding should be freely available to the public, and that there's a serious problem with the system of publishing that A, traps most of that knowledge inside scholarly journals, that B, are owned by private corporations, that C, profit handsomely by selling those journals back to universities, which D, are contractually obligated to restrict access to those journals to their own staff and students. So Swartz apparently decided to do something about this. This is a too short version of a long and tangled story. In, or, sorry, in 2010 and 2011, he downloaded nearly 5 million files from JSTOR, um, which is a not-for-profit online database for academic journals that is con itself contractually bound to uphold the access restrictions required by the journal publishers. And he presumably did so with the goal of making all those articles freely and publicly available. I say presumably because we don't and can't know Schwartz's actual intentions. He was caught and arrested before he had fully duplicated the JSTOR database. He got about two-thirds of the way through. He was indicted on more than a dozen federal felony charges, which could have resulted in a 35-year prison sentence and $1 million in fines. Before his case could go to trial, he hung himself. Again, his reasons will never be known. He left no note. But what evidence we have suggests that he was unable to cope with the vast gap between what we think he was trying to do in terms of making knowledge available to the ordinary people who had paid for it and the severity of the punishment that the government wanted to bring down on his head in order to protect the ill-gotten property interests of wealthy corporations. Schwartz's story also leads me back to the old English folk poem I quoted at the start. The bit I quoted then does a fine job of calling out the hypocrisy of a society that rewards the rich when they take from the poor, but punishes the poor when they take from anyone. But the final stanza of the poem takes that critique a step further, a step in the direction that Swartz apparently wanted to take, and serves as a call to arms that any pirate worthy of the name should be willing to answer. The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common and geese will still a common lack till they go and steal it back. Thanks. <laughs>